Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Hendrick, and I am the alumni director at CSUB. Uh, it's so great to see everybody, even if we're on Zoom. Um, we can see each other's faces a little bit better maybe than even we would um, in an in-person event. So welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for our seventh annual Alumni Rising Runner event. This is the first time we're doing this virtually. Um, so it's been an experiment, but it's been a great week and a lot of fun um, getting to know each of our rising runners this week. Just to tell you a little bit about this event, we created this event um, during homecoming in conjunction with student affairs. Uh, and the idea was to bring recent alumni back, recognize them for all of the amazing accomplishments um, and all of the amazing things they're doing in their career and give students a chance to see, you know, how their um, transition after college has gone, learn a little bit about their um, success, kind of hear from them directly about their path and uh, what they're doing now. And so who better for students to learn from than people who were in their shoes just a few short years ago. Each Dean of CSUB's four academic schools, as well as the Dean of CSUB Antelope Valley chooses an alumni rising runner in consultation with faculty. That's one of the great things about this event is that it is, um, it's your faculty members and your deans who are choosing this rising runner and each school and the camp Antelope Valley campus chooses one each year. Today is our fourth alumni rising runner event of this homecoming at home week. Tomorrow we will honor and hear from the rising runner from the School of Social Sciences and Education, uh, and you are invited to attend that event as well. And this is live, so um, you may hear my dog in the background. I think she's getting ready to bark at a water truck um, on the street. Um, so just uh, one more thing to mention, um, CSUB President Dr. Lynette Zelezny, she loves this program, she loves the alum Alumni Rising Runner program, but unfortunately she couldn't be with us today, so we do have a few words from her to share with you. A warm hello to our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends and welcome home runners. Though we cannot be in the same place today as we celebrate five outstanding rising runners, make no mistake, we are together. For CSUB is not just a physical location. CSUB is a feeling. CSUB is family. CSUB is connection. CSUB is a sense of belonging. CSUB is home. As Maya Angelou once said, the ache for home lives in all of us. At CSUB, we focus on helping our students use their gifts and talents to build a road to their future, which will take them out into the world to serve their families, neighbors, and communities. But just as that road leads them away from the university, it also leads our alumni back. This week, we celebrate that return in spirit, if not in body. And we welcome our runners back into the warm embrace of our extended family. The five amazing alumni we are celebrating this week are called Rising Runners for a reason. They are climbing a ladder of success, and as they climb, they lift others along with them. Each school will celebrate its own rising runner at separate occasions this week. But I want to recognize each of our rising runners before the entire CSUB community. The Antelope Valley campus recognizes rising runner Serena Muhammad, who received her Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and Management in 2015 and Master of Business Administration in 2017. Serena is giving back by serving as a business service representative for Goodwill Southern California. The School of Arts and Humanities recognizes rising runner Dr. Jamal Wright who earned his Bachelor of Arts in History in 2015, Master of Arts in History in 2017, and Doctorate in Educational Leadership in 2020. Dr. Wright is an Associate Professor of History at Bakersfield College. The School of Business and Public Administration recognizes rising runner Bailey Cook, 
who received her Bachelor of Science in Business Administration in 2018. Bailey is a subcontract specialist for Northrop Grumman. The School of Natural Sciences, Mathematics, and Engineering recognizes rising runner Dr. Nick Toothman, who earned his Bachelor of Science in Computer Science in 2010. Nick went on to earn his doctorate in computer science from UC Davis in 2020. Dr. Toothman is an assistant professor right here at CSUB. The School of Social Sciences and Education recognizes rising runner Alex Dominguez, who earned a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science in 2017. Alex received his Juris Doctorate from the University of Mississippi Law School in 2020 and is an associate attorney here in Bakersfield for Klein, Dinatelli, and Goldner. Thank you, Rising Runners, for sharing your knowledge, your talents, and your light with the communities you serve. And a special note of gratitude to the faculty and staff who helped you discover the magic within you. Here's to you, Runners, and here's to never forgetting your way back home. Congratulations. Thank you, President Zelezny, and for always supporting this event. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to all of the students who are here. This is the best um, turnout we've had all week. So kudos to NSME, you guys are awesome. Um, I'd now like to introduce Todd McBride, who is the Interim Dean of the School of Natural Sciences, Math and Engineering. Dr. McBride, I'll turn the, turn the Zoom over to you. Thank, thank you, Sarah, and welcome everyone. It's uh, truly a, a, a fun time when we get to celebrate our alumni and their accomplishments. And yes, I'm proud of NSME for having the, the big turnout that we do. We are um, always supporting each other and it's a great, it's a great time to, uh, to be a runner. Uh, in this case, we're celebrating a, a alumni that uh, we, I guess we have a, a double celebration, not only is our rising runner in NSME uh, distinguished alumni, but he returned back to NSME and as the president indicated, he's an assistant professor here. So that's really, really a cool thing. It's kind of a double celebration today for NSME. Uh, I'm going to turn the screen over to Melissa Danforth to talk a little bit more about Nick. But before I do that, I, I think it's important to note that uh, Melissa and Nick have, have kind of followed the same path and uh, went away uh, after graduating from CSUB to get a PhD and came back. So they went to the same institution to get a PhD and came back to CSUB. That shows you how great we are that our uh, distinguished alumni want to come home and, and be a part of the NSME family. Okay, so with all that gushing stuff there, uh, Melissa, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. McBride. Uh, it's my pleasure to tell you about Nick Toothman, the rising runner we celebrate today. Nick is in his second year as an assistant professor of computer science here at CSUB, his alma mater. And he says it's really nice to give back to a program that gave him his professional start. Uh, Nick's interest in computer go back to childhood when he was intrigued by how video games were created. Uh, he was a graduate at Bakersfield's Liberty High School, and he enrolled in CSUB because at the time it was the economical choice for a college, but then he instantly fell in love with the campus and is particularly grateful to several faculty mentors here. Uh, while he was here at CSUB as a computer science student, he interned for State Farm, developing database systems. And that taught Nick what work life could look like after graduation. And it also showed State Farm the talent that they could tap here at CSUB. And Nick is hoping to develop more partnerships of a similar nature between CSUB and industry to provide future CSUB computer science students that opportunity that he had. Uh, as Dr. McBride said, after earning his bachelor's degree in computer science from CSUB in 2010, uh, Nick went on to UC Davis to pursue his PhD, hoping to one day become a tenure track professor. Nick's research area is in computer animations, uh, specifically the use of virtual reality and animation algorithms for virtual reality. But interestingly, uh, he also collaborated with the UC Davis department to make a motion tracking platform 
for producing Shakespeare plays so that you can actually interact as a virtual avatar in a Shakespeare play instead of having to do a, a live action Shakespeare play. And that's something that I'm hoping that he will replicate here at CSUB. I've put him in contact with our theater department to see if we can have a similar activity here at CSUB. Uh, while Nick was at UC Davis, he also interned at Oculus, Microsoft, and Amazon. So make sure to ask him about how he nabbed those prestigious gigs. And many of us here in the computer science department were uh, glad to see that Nick was coming back to, to the home here and rejoining us as a faculty member. We kind of all jockeyed for who would be the faculty person to nominate Nick for the Rising Runner Award. And it was a very much a collaborative uh, support from the department for this particular award. So the Alumni Association and CSUB and the Computer Science Department are very lucky to have Nick as a part of our alumni family. And uh, the Alumni Association will be sending Nick a plaque and other tokens of congratulation for be, being named an alumni rising runner. Normally we would hand those over if we were in person, but obviously virtually makes that a little bit difficult. Uh, so with that said, Nick, would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much everyone for those generous descriptions and introductions. Uh, it's very humbling to hear that kind of stuff about you, but uh, I just wanna say that I've been extremely lucky to have so many wonderful colleagues uh, in most of my jobs and internships. And at CSUB, that bar has been set higher than I could have ever thought. Um, it means a lot to see so many students here too, and to see some family members. Uh, shout out to my mom, happy birthday, and uh, to my dad and sister and beautiful wife. Uh, thank you all for coming. It It's still really nice to see this kind of thing happen over Zoom. Uh, as someone said earlier, it's in a way really uh, great to see everyone's faces presented in a way that isn't so physically far away. And if we end up doing virtual things again, I might be able to help out with a virtual setup to pantomime physically handing over awards and uh, certifications and things like that. So. I'll keep you posted if I can put anything together in the next year or so. Okay, uh, thank you, Nick. Um, now we get to the fun part. We're gonna do some questions and, and answers with, with Nick. Um, learn about his experiences and, and uh, find out what, uh, what made him successful. Um, we'll be taking questions from the students and that will be through the, the chat. There's some instructions up on the screen right now uh, that you can follow. Uh, you can contact Mary and, and uh, she will then feed the questions to me. Um, and she will moderate. I have not been teaching in the age of Zoom, so please be patient. I'm in lots of Zoom meetings, but uh, not, not so much this format. So. I'll be learning along with uh, what a lot of the rest of you are doing now because of our, our unique situation with COVID. Uh, I've got a few questions for Nick and to get us started, but please uh, have your questions for him and uh, really want the students to be involved and learn what they can from Nick. And it's great to have an example of someone from our university that has gone off and, and gone to graduate school and come back and as really a model of, of success and what we want to celebrate here. Okay, Nick, so uh, what is one thing that you would tell your um, students or your, tell your former self when you were transitioning from school to career? So if you could look back and say, Nick, in 2010, you know, what, what uh, would help you transitioning from school to career? I'd, I'd love to give past Nick a lot of advice. I'm just not sure he would listen. Um, I, I would say find some hobbies that don't involve the computer. Uh, at the time, I just, I ate everything up I could, uh, playing games or working on hobby projects. And it's important to kind of diversify and get some, some activity that isn't in front of a screen. 
I think I, I've got an okay handle on that now, but if I had started a bit earlier too, that would have, that would have helped out. Uh, in hindsight, I would say that when I had interviews, exams, when I had to travel, the, I had about 10 times the amount of worry that was probably appropriate for the situation. And it's easy to see that looking back. And I try to remember that looking forward to, um, I still get nervous before, you know, big events and big things. And I think that's just part of it. But as soon as it gets underway, you, you realize most of that calms down and you're able to do what you were planning to without all of that worry beforehand, it might've been nice. Um, when you're a student, you might hear advice like, don't bite off more than you can chew. And it's tough to follow because you're trying to figure out how large your bite really is at the time. So I'd say you're still in the process of figuring that out. And it's okay if you bite off more than you can chew sometimes, but if you realize that, um, it's better to spit something back out than to choke. So, you know, aim, aim high and follow your ambition. But when you hit walls, you know, be prepared to take a step back from time to time and, you know, give yourself that, that space and breathing room. Uh, good advice. So are, is, is 2021 Nick listening to 2021 Nick? He's trying. Okay, good. All right. So a lot of students are trying to figure out a career path after graduation. I know for me, that was a challenge. So how did you know um, this was the career for you? At what point did you know you wanted to be a professor and not necessarily come back to CSUB, but to be a professor? Yeah, uh, that emerged a little bit at a time and it's hard to put it on an exact moment, but there are these little milestones that kind of gave me some tells. Like I, I really enjoyed helping my students out in the classes I was taking when there was an opportunity to. Um, Dr. Danforth was my first computer science professor uh, back where, when we were in the other science building. Uh, and if I had known that at the time my first professor was going to be my first department chair and my colleague later on, I, I'm not sure I would have believed it, but she was a huge inspiration in, in following a path that took me into academia. Um, but you know the the other pieces kind of came together over time. I really like I really like pu uh, puzzle solving as a kid and trying to fix the problems that I made on a computer. Uh, and the classroom was somewhere some a place that I always felt comfortable enough to feel like myself. Um, I it took a while to realize that there's an opportunity there. I don't have to stay a student forever. I could uh, go to the other side and be the faculty member that helps students like me uh, find their own way. That's great. Sometimes in graduate school, it does feel like you're gonna be a student forever, but- Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I need to get through. Okay, great. What career mistakes have you made that taught you the best lessons? Um, early on, I, I thought it was more important to prove that I understood something than to ask questions to get clarification or you know, save a lot of time early on. I thought that being successful meant that you could do it without help. And it took, it took a lot of, uh, you know, roadblocks to really get past that. Uh, I try to encourage my students now to come to office hours and ask for help the day of, or send an email that day if something was unclear. And it, it I, I feel like it's really helped them uh, clear those hurdles early on. And it, it helps me figure out uh, sort of gauging in the classroom what is landing with the students and what needs a little more attention. And so I can try to respond to that a little more quickly. Um, I, I wouldn't call it a mistake if you learn something from it and you can mold that into what you do next. But in 2014, I took a Microsoft internship uh, while I was at UC Davis that I thought would end up putting me into a uh, product area that I had passion for, like uh, animation, computer graphics, video game development. And I ended up working on the Office 365 team. Uh, so I, I made some health check uh, routines for uh, Microsoft Exchange. 
You know, it was a really interesting experience. I got a lot out of seeing the infrastructure at Microsoft and just kind of being awed by the resources they had. I met some wonderful people, but the, the personal drive to uh, express passion in that job wasn't in sync with me. Um, and if you're going for internships, you, you really want to be clear on the relocation terms and try to get decent housing support because we ended up in an apartment for about three months with no furniture. Um, and that was, that was the only choice that we could really make work for our situation at the time. So we, we came out of it. We learned a lot. They, you know, they offer full-time positions to most of their interns when it's over. And at the end, I had the choice of taking that and I decided I'd, I wanted to stay in school instead. So there was also a way to realize that, you know, whatever path you take, there's opportunity there and you just have to want it. Excellent. Thank you. Good advice. Okay, we've got some questions from the audience now, so I'll, I'll uh, switch to those. Um, so Nick, what's your favorite part of virtual reality and how do you see that changing our daily lives in the future? Since it's still such a new uh, field, I love seeing these tiny tech demos that people come up with that do something totally bizarre uh, or novel. Um, there's a great community of VR developers on Twitter that will share some really interesting uh, human computer interaction techniques or go into a deep dive on interface design and why floating menus in space is still critical even when there's this tactical and tangible feedback uh, opportunity there. Uh, one of my favorite things in VR is uh, multiplayer collaborating with other people. And that doesn't necessarily mean playing a game. It can just be having a physical presence uh, with other people and having this 3D spatialized sound where someone standing to your left is coming in through your left ear. And that kind of stuff, just the, the ability to gesture and to share and express some of your personality with your hand and head movements. It, it just, it adds this natural feel to it that I, I want everyone to have a chance to experience because it, it really changed how I imagined working with computers and other people in hopefully the near future. Excellent, thank you. So um, what was, this is another question from the audience. What was your inspiration for, and your purpose for returning to your alma mater to teach? And I just wanna add that I know how challenging it is sometimes for the computer science department to, to recruit people because there is such a high demand for people in your area that you can go, you could go anywhere you wanted. So what was your inspiration for returning to CSUV besides the fact we know it's great, but. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, obviously it's the best school. Uh, I, it felt like a little serendipitous. I started my job search uh, in October of 2018 and I, thought on a whim to kind of check what CSUB might have posted. And there was a faculty position lined up. And I thought, well, at the very least, that is a free trip back home to see the old school and see some faces I haven't in a while. Uh, you know, hopefully get a chance to just take it in. But the opportunities that they presented and gave me this potential to establish my own research program uh, develop my own software, work with students under my own uh, authority and uh, oversight. And that the, the fit, the, the potential there and being able to come back to a place that I love uh, felt too good to be true. So I, I actually, in my job search, I looked at quite a few places, but uh, the, the primary one, my first choice was uh, CSUB from the start, just because I realized that there was an opportunity for there, uh, for me there that. Uh, no matter where else I might have looked, it, it wouldn't have felt the same. Excellent. Um, so Nick, what advice would you give to current CSU students uh, trying to balance uh, classes and workloads? And I think this is primarily for the computer science students trying to balance um, their, their classes and workloads. Yeah, you know, doing instruction on Zoom has kind of cranked up the workload for the faculty and the students to a degree 
none of us really could anticipate ahead of time. Uh, we're, we're appreciating that everyone is, is dealing with this kind of overload to a point that in my own classroom, I'll try to uh, exercise leniency when it comes to late submissions to some degree. My, my students see this in the syllabus on day one, so they, they hopefully feel at home. Uh, and, and I try to promote the small group breakout room experience enough because I see more interaction driven that way that can lend a little bit of the socializing aspect while we're still trying to move forward with the uh, material. Uh, it's, it's really tough to do the balancing between all of your work, uh, in, especially in our department, because I've been there and I know what that feels like, and experience life outside of it. Uh, sometimes it feels like one gets put on hold so that the other can move forward. Uh, the best advice I can say is making time for yourself every day that does not involve your computer. Uh, I, I take to walking and biking just because it gets me moving and I do some of my best thinking when I'm not in front of the computer because the blood is pumping and you have some context and distance from what you're working on. Uh, I, I think every developer should have some kind of exercise routine built into their schedule just so they can experience that. And you can sometimes save yourself a couple hours of work if you took that 10 minute break to take a walk around and realize, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree or there's a more straightforward approach that you just couldn't see because you were looking at it too closely. Yeah, that's great. Take take a little break, push away from the from the desk, and and clear your mind. Get some pump the sludge through the vessels and get get things sort of organized in your brain. Yeah. Um, what advice would you have for students that are considering graduate school? Um, how do you know that's the the right um, choice for you? And um, you know, what advice should someone continue their education or not? Yeah. So when I was looking at grad school, I applied to a bunch of UCs and it was UCLA, Berkeley, Irvine and Davis and I think Santa Barbara too. Um, I wanted to stay in California and the classes that I took in undergrad, as interesting as they were, they left me with a lot more questions than I came in with. So if you find that, you know, going through the curriculum is spawning more questions then you have answers to and you want to pursue those, uh, grad school can be a really good fit for you to, you know, continue that. The, the giveaway is um, once you get there, you're just going to end up with even more questions, but you do start to see the bigger pictures of how the field is moving and where we've come from. I really enjoyed the process of uh, meeting and, and speaking with faculty at the universities I was applying for. Uh, if you have good one-on-one -on -one interactions with your uh, professors in undergrad, you do a lot more of that in grad school. And that can be a good indicator that you know, it's a good fit for you. But curiosity was a big driver. Uh, the courses I took, the, you know, the upper division ones got more and more challenging. But as hard as it felt, I never wanted to stop or really give up. I wanted to take breaks and I, I needed to clear my head with it. But I wanted to come back. And all of those things to me felt like this is a good indicator that uh, I'm not I'm not ready to be finished. So if I could, I'd be taking a bunch more classes just because I, I enjoy that. But uh, teaching is its own kind of class. Excellent. So uh, I asked you earlier, what advice would you give uh, Nick 10 years ago or so? Yeah. Now we have a question asking, well, where do you see yourself 10 years in the future? What are your career goals and what are your aspirations looking forward in your career? I, uh, you know, the last year and a half of teaching has, has been amazing. And it's also highlighted what I need to uh, improve on. Just, you know, that, that personal assessment where you see things you could do better the next time. I don't see that feedback loop you know, quitting anytime soon. I, I've really taken to the position in the classroom to help people learn. Uh, teaching has become a major passion for me and I've focused mainly on that in my time here so far. I think I'd like to continue pushing my research in virtual reality forward 
uh, develop a lab with some nice fancy hardware when it's safe to do that in person again, spend a little bit of more of that startup money in the meantime. Uh, the whole department and the resources that we have at CSB have, have really exciting potential for the future. I'd like to get involved with uh, collaboration with some of the uh, faculty in my department and reach out to some of the other departments on campus and do some interesting work with them and continue the interdisciplinary love that I developed when I was at Davis. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanna en encourage the students to continue with their questions. This is your chance to learn from, from Nick and maybe uh, get to know uh, your professor on a little bit more personal level and what kinds of things uh, have, have helped them along the way. So keep, keep those questions coming. So uh, Nick, what has been your favorite part of being a member of the faculty at CSUB uh, and, and compare that to when you were a student here? So how has the experience been different as a faculty member and what do you like best about that? Um, I like that there's not as much distance between me and the, uh, and the lecturers and professors. You know, you have that kind of built-in separation as a student, as much as you wanna speak with them, there's always that clear indication uh, of the roles that we're all, you know, following. And I always wondered what it'd be like to be on the other side of that and sort of have the, uh, you know, the uh, coffee room talks or the uh, break room experience. So in the light of doing this online, uh, Dr. Danforth's Discord server with the other faculty members has been something I look forward to checking uh, routinely and just getting the reminder that the other faculty is amazing as they are, we're all human and we have human problems and that kind of helps to keep me grounded and not feel so far away from people while we're all kind of uh, doing this isolation thing. Okay, thank you. So uh, when you've gone after jobs, um, what have you done to set yourself apart from the competition? You can also maybe talk about this with, with your internship. Having an internship with Microsoft is a, is a big deal. So how have you set yourself apart to, to be successful? Yeah, you know, the, the Microsoft internship in particular, the interview process was probably the most rigorous one I had. Uh, it involved flying out to Redmond for a day. Uh, that was the first time I rented a car, so that was a big deal. And it, it's coming in the day before, trying to get a good night's sleep and usually falling short, and then spending 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. that day meeting with uh, team members one at a time. Each one is going to have a different interview style and a problem for you. Uh, some of them just want to see what you have to say about an interesting topic. And you want to be prepared to express that passion when it's time to. Uh, others will give you something that's a little more cookie cutter from the pool of computer science interview questions. Usually there's a question in there about graph traversal. So be familiar with your uh, graph algorithms. And no matter who you're talking to, remembering the human side of the job, it's easy to stand in awe of this amazing technology and these massive companies, but they were built by people and they're, they're maintained by people. Uh, it, it's important to kind of show that you are putting the person first, including yourself when you talk to them. Uh, and you can appreciate that the technical interview process is a crapshoot. You're going to get a big variety of takes and in interview styles. Being adaptive and being able to sort of think on your feet is always going to help you out in those situations. But when you're dealing with a problem, uh, they're looking to see how you think, not just what answer you give or how right it is. They want to see your thought process in motion. So it's important to take some time to think out loud and ask for those clarifying questions early on and not rush through it. You might know the answer for what they're asking for instantly, but if you, you know, shut down for two minutes to jot everything you can as fast as possible, it doesn't give the same impression as demonstrating that you actually understand the approach you're taking here and not just uh, reciting something from memory. So just pacing yourself during these moments and appreciating that, you know, we all need to express what we're thinking and doing so verbally 
in that process is a big help. Excellent. So to this point, Nick, what would you say is the, um, your, your, mo your proudest achievement in your career so far? I guess we have to say beyond being nominated as the rising runner. Uh, so <laughs> where, where, what is your, your um, consider, you consider your proudest achievement in your career? I had the chance to not only design, but implement and execute uh, an, ex an entire experimental design when I was at Oculus, now Facebook Reality Labs. It was the other internships I had were three months at a time and they were pretty start and finish oriented. Um, the Oculus internship was a different experience altogether. It was six months of time, so the commitment was longer. I ran about, I think about 120 people through an hour and a half experiment. Uh, and it was all done in virtual reality with motion tracking uh, equipment. And I had a massive amount of data to analyze after that. It was, it was my first humongous project that got to be executed in a corporate environment with insane amounts of resources and uh, technology to make that possible. The fact that I was able to do that uh, was, was beyond anything I had expected in my career up to that point. So there was, it was a real landmark moment where I realized, you know, the, you practice experimental design and execution throughout grad school as you work on your thesis and your uh, supporting projects. But getting a chance to uh, exercise that in a bigger scope was just uh, amazing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So here's an important question from a student. H have you ever experienced imposter syndrome either as a computer science student or professionally? And if so, how did you overcome that? Yeah, I really started to feel that after undergrad. Uh, during my time at CSUB as a student, I felt like I was right where I was supposed to be progress wise and, you know, uh, engaging with the material. Um, I felt like it was tough, but this is, this is right at my difficulty level. And it was getting into grad school in a school with a massive number of uh, talented students and very impressive faculty with these multi-million dollar grants coming in every single day. I mean, you become acutely aware of the mechanisms that drive the school forward once you move into graduate level. Uh, that's still happening at the undergraduate level, but mainly you're concerned about your classwork. So seeing just how much potential and talent was around you, it, it made the imposter syndrome just skyrocket. Um, I, I felt that off and on for plenty of courses, uh, and sometimes the best advice was acknowledging, yes, I feel this way. Uh, there, there were some of the best advice I had heard, and it was only recently after grad school was, you know, if you're dealing with imposter syndrome, it, it comes from this sense of you're not as good as the people around you, but you're there. You made it there on your merit. Uh, do you really think that you are smart enough to fool those people? in the sense that, you know, it would take just as much effort to fake the moon landing as it would to just go to the moon. So you have a similar experience there where you can appreciate that if I'm here, it's because I'm, I, I earned it. And if you can take that and roll with it and quiet down that voice from time to time, you know, it, it still pops up and that's okay. You can just sort of come to peace with it and realize that that isn't the driving factor in what you're doing. So that, that's my best advice I can give is, you know, you, you got here because you already had the capability and moving forward is just, it's part of the process you know, and trying not to get too caught up on that feeling and remembering that your hard work brought you to where you are, uh, can really help bring that back down to a normal level. And then it can become kind of an aid that just keeps you advancing and moving forward and not totally stopping you. That's, that's great advice for our students that are here right now. If, if you're listening, you're here because your talents got you here. So always remember that and, and keep that um, in, in your thoughts anytime that you have doubts. You're, you're here because you belong here. 
and, and you're talented. Okay, uh, Nick, um, how do you balance work and school with your personal projects? Yeah, uh, the, so last summer was the first time I had a summer off to myself since I was 16. Uh, and I didn't really know what to do with the time at first. I think I just slept a lot for the first week. And then after that, I, I tried to get back into some of the stuff I had put off. Um, having that little bit of space in between the end of the semester and really appreciating the, the opportunity to have such a rare, you know, vacation was, you know, almost overwhelming where if I don't plan this out, I'm it's summer's going to pass and I'm going to have felt like it was a waste, but overthinking it can be a problem there too. I ended up just picking up a project I had left alone for about two years uh, just to keep the skills fresh and make a little bit of forward movement on it. And it gave me a chance to see it without the pressure of a deadline for filing for graduation or a conference submission that would normally rob you of the experience. Um, so that was kind of a novel opportunity for me. Uh, during the school year, I try to keep weekends as as uh, open as possible when it comes to going out, well, going out as in the way that you can right now. Uh, mainly it's bike rides and hikes and things where you have some good distance. So exercising has been the best way for me to kind of deal with that. Uh, I'd like to get better at, you know, developing healthier sleep habits, um, but that's an ongoing problem. Okay. So uh, earlier you talked a little bit about graduate school and, and one of our students wants to know or have you elaborate on jumping from a bachelor's program to a PhD program? How do you bridge that, that gap? Yeah, yeah. So you might not have known this as much. The career pathway for many, many people ends up looking like a bachelor's and then a master's and then a PhD if you're going in that direction. Uh, a lot of programs will accept undergrads with their bachelor's directly into a PhD program. It's usually an option reserved for domestic, you know, U.S. students. If you're an international student, they usually ask for a master's program before and admission into the Ph.D. Not always, um, but that is an opportunity for you. Uh, you can take an exam along the way to have your master's degree. Uh, you can also file a master's thesis and then work on something else for the Ph.D., depending on the path you want to take but you don't necessarily need to have a master's already secured before pursuing a doctorate. And it, it depends on the field, but computer science, especially from the CSUs to the UCs, that pathway has been around for a while. And it's a great opportunity if you feel like uh, starting something right after undergrad, which is what I ended up doing. Uh, would this be a good time to plug the new master's program in computer science? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so when I was a student at CSUB, um, there was talk from the chair at the time, Dr. Mark Thomas, about the master's program proposal that was hopefully going to get good feedback, you know, in a short amount of time. And when I came back from my job interviews uh, in 2019, the, you know, one of the things I had heard about from Dr. Danforth was that the master's program uh, proposal was uh, getting ready to be filed. And it was, you know, it, it, good things take time, um, but we do have uh, approval and we are working on the marketing material and recruitment for our first, uh, I forget the term, but for first set of cohorts mm -hmm. uh, for the fall 2021 semester. Yes, and we're super excited about that. So what advice um, would you give students who are interested in pursuing a career in the field of computer graphics? And are alumni with a bachelor's of science able to compete with those with a higher level of study? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You are uh, capable of competing. What grad school will give you is an opportunity to uh, really explore a few different key areas in computer graphics and what you'll probably encounter very quickly is the sense that your mathematics uh, are really going to come back in full force. So you already know that you need things like linear algebra 
and good trigonometry skills. Uh, probability theory and calculus will also get you a long way when it comes to more advanced graphics. Uh, something that I see echoed continuously with graphic developers is I need to do my math homework. So if you have an inclination that those math problems are actually fun and something you want to keep up with, uh, there's always a chance for you to compete with people who took a longer or more formal route to get there. Um, what I would say is expanding your uh, search area for graphics jobs is important. Uh, it is a competitive field because it, it tends to not have as many job openings as things like database and web development. So you do want to look far and wide. You can even look outside of the country because there are places in Europe and Asia that will hire tons of graphic developers if you're willing to relocate. Um, but there are a lot of small startups that give opportunities for freshly minted bachelor degree holders as well. Um, the search can just take a while and in the process of preparing for that, it's good to start working on that demo reel. So come up with some good recordings of the things that you've made in your own time or for your classes. That way you have something visible to share. That's one of the best things about computer graphics for me is that uh, what you've put in for work usually has some visual demonstration of the outcome. So working on that demo reel now and taking on toy projects and building on them is, you know, it, it's never been a better time to be a graphics developer because the tools and the resources have only gotten better. Okay, well, due to our time constraints, we're going to have to make that the final question. But if you're a student and, and you didn't get a chance to get your question answered, you can see from our conversation here that Dr. Toothman is a very approachable uh, professor, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk with you during, your off, during his office hours. Um, that was, that's always a, a challenge for students to um, learn that they can approach their professors and have conversations with them. And so this, this type of format is great for students to kind of, you know, get, get past that shyness and see that their professors are really cool people and, and are, you know, have a lot to offer besides just what they present in the classroom. Okay. So thank you for that excellent uh, round of questions and answers, Nick, very, very helpful for our students and fun for us to get to know you better too. Yeah, thank you okay, so much. So with that, I'll, I'll send it back to, to Sarah. Uh, thanks, Nick. Awesome. Thank you, Dean McBride. And um, thank you, Nick. Such a, a fascinating conversation. Um, and so happy that so many students joined us today. And I echo what Dean McBride said and hope you'll reach out to Nick um, with more questions. I think we probably could have talked to you or listened to your experience for another hour, Nick. So thank you so much. And congratulations again to you. Well-deserved. Um, thank you, Dr. Danforth, for your nomination and collaboration with your uh, faculty colleagues, really appreciate it. Um, it's great to get to know some of our rising young alumni better and be able to connect to them with students who can benefit from their insights. Just a reminder that there is one more Alumni Rising Runner event this week. Tomorrow, Social Sciences and Education will celebrate Alex Dominguez, a young lawyer who has also worked in local politics. Given the national and local political scene, that should be interesting, so make sure to tune in tomorrow. You can register for tomorrow's event on the same homecoming site where you signed up for today's event. There's a registration link on the alumni website, csub.edu backslash alumni. You can also find other homecoming at home programming by visiting csub.edu backslash homecoming. So thank you again to not only students, but faculty and staff and uh, my other colleagues who are on the call today, really appreciate it. It was a great event um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.